Right. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. Um, so today's talk's a little bit different to some of the other things you might have seen today. So today we're going to talk about our research into the car hacking that we did. So we had a look at the Mitsubishi Outlander. So just a little bit of explanation of who I am. My name is Tony G and I, I work for Pentest Partners. And so we do quite a lot of pen testing, as you would expect. We also do um, a bit of research in our spare time. We had a look at the Outlander. So why did we look at the car? Well, when you look at cars, there's, there's actually quite a large attack surface. And actually, it's not that complicated when you think to, to look at it. A lot of people think, oh, well, do, you, do you need to understand about how car area networks work? And do you need to understand about ECUs? And actually, it's not really that complex. A lot of it is just to do with simple attacks. If you look at some of the previous attacks, Charlie Miller and Chris Vadset, they, they simply looked at the infotainment system, and that wasn't properly bridged or properly segregated between the, the, the cab. Uh, then if you look at Scott Helm and, and Troy Hunt's work, again, look at the infotainment area of the, of the system. And what they found is that just simply through using Wireshark, they were able to identify these vulnerabilities. Um, the Tesla guys, they did some work just looking at weak passwords. What we find, though, is almost hardly ever about the actual CAN itself and about the ECUs, more often than not about the other stuff like the Wi-Fi. And that is because simply they are they're a huge attack surface. So you've got the wireless networks that are coming into them, you've got the infotainment systems, you've got GSM, you've got all of these other things coming into them and going out, which you can look at. So we've done a little bit of research in the past, we've done some research, didn't really get as much publicity as we, we got with the with the Outlander. We looked at the i3, for example, and the i8, primarily because we've got friends who've got one, so it's quite easy to look at them. It's not easy to go out and buy a car for research, especially if you're going to break it. Um, so we had a quick look at those, and, and what we found is that there was a number of issues with the provisioning of, uh, of, of the i3 around the connected drive app, or the, the mobile app. So there's a little app you can use to authenticate with the car and then unlock it and do various bits and pieces with it. Um, we found there were some issues with that. Ultimately, we managed to get those those fixed. And so, if you know what, if you've got an i3 and you've got the connected app, then you know chances are those one of this is going to be fixed. Um, we had a look at the i8. A lot more expensive car, quite a cool car. Definitely would buy one if I had the money. Um, there we found that there was a number of plain text communications just simply between the car API up to the server. So essentially, the API was over HTTP. Um, that's quite a, a lot harder to exploit in terms of attacking the car because it's only talking out over GSM. Um, we were also able to enumerate the VIN from there, and if, if you have a quick look, so the way you set up the, uh, the connected drive app, um, you essentially provide your first name, last name as your username. And in fact, customer services, BMW customer services, actually recommend you use that. And that's not very good, really. You know, first name, last name, please guess, especially if you know your mate's name. Quite easy to guess their name and first name, last name. That's probably going to be their username. And then you can enumerate your VIN, as I said, through through the registration page. But not only that, you can then re reset the password. And when you reset the password, it just goes to a simple five-character password. So it's quite easy to enumerate user IDs and guess passwords for the connected drive app. And of course, once you set up the connected drive app, you then gain access to the car. It's scary stuff. But we, you know, and that's all of our previous research. We then had a quick look at the Outlander, and the Outlander does it slightly differently. The way the Outlander does it is they've got Wi-Fi connectivity on the device. However, the wireless connectivity is not for you know end users to be able to use. It's not a wireless access point in the car. It doesn't talk out a uh, uh, VW. It doesn't talk out with client mode as a. Uh, 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 Tesla does, for example, it doesn't connect to your own Wi Fi. It is essentially a wireless access point on the car. So essentially, the car has its own wireless access point, and then you use the remote, your, the, the application on your phone, to then connect to that wireless access point, which is a really bizarre way of doing it. It's also a very cheap way of doing it, which I guess is why they did it. Most people, when they set up a connected car, they're like BMW, for example. They have an API that the car talks to, and then you talk to, and then effectively you talk to BMW, BMW talks to your car. And so it's very hard to actually get direct access to the actual car, whereas with this, relatively easy to get direct access to the car because it is effectively a wireless access point. 
What can you do once you've got it set up? Well, you can do things like the air conditioning. You can turn on the air conditioning. So these systems have got an auxiliary heater so you're able, and cooler, so you're able to use battery power to cool your car or warm it up so that you know, when you get into it in the morning it's the right temperature for you, depending on what type of year it is. You, know, you can also turn on the lights, for example, and flash the headlights. So when you're in a car park trying to find your car, you're able to flash the headlights. The Wi-Fi range is not very long, so you kind of have to be near your car to turn on the lights, which is a bit pointless, but anyway, that's another story. You can do things like uh, setting schedules for, for the charging. It's an electric car. The Outlander is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So you, know, you can charge it and set schedules for that charging. So it does it in the middle of the night, so you get a little bit less, less uh, bill on your electricity. Um, you can also turn on and off the alarm, which we'll talk about in a bit. The way it works, when you buy one of these, you get a manual, as you expect, and in the manual contains the SSID and the password for the, for the access point. Now, bizarrely, you can change the name of the SSID, but you can't change the password, which is a really weird concept. So you can effectively make it whatever you want, but not change the password. And most people, as you can imagine, probably wouldn't bother changing the SSID. And what's the point? You know, password potentially, yeah, but why would you bother changing the SSID? So the key in terms of cracking it is relatively easy because there's a lot of commonality, commonality with them. So the SSID is, uh, is always remote and then two numbers and then four lowercase letters. The password is always four lowercase letters and six numbers. And that's just not good enough when it comes to passwords for, for wireless access points. You know, it's really easy to crack that. We've got a very basic cracking wheel with just four graphics cards. It took us a couple of days to crack that password. You know, we've upgraded that, we've got a 16 graphics card rig, we're now going to do it in about 12 hours. In reality, if we really wanted to gain access to one of these cars, we'd probably use something like AWS. It costs a thousand dollars, we estimate, to be able to crack it. But that thousand dollars, you know, you're able to gain access to a car. And that car's worth about forty thousand pounds. So from that respect, you know, it's, a, it's quite cost effective. It's not that bad. Once you crack the key, of course, we can then gain ourselves a, a man in the middle position. So you know, in the way we have set about attacking it, we we find yep, we can crack the key. Okay, that's fine. But let's just set up a man in the middle position so that we can then start to have a look at what's being sent from the phone to to the car. And you know what we found is our ultimate game, our ultimate goal was was to see if we could do away with the app and see if we could ultimately crack the key and then issue the commands directly from our computer. So first thing we set to do, we've got a man in the position. Next thing we set is let's set up Wireshark to have a quick look at it. And as I say, it's really easy when you start to start to attack cars. It's not complex stuff. It's just Wireshark. So let's have a quick look at what that Wireshark looks like. So I've got a capture here, let me just find. So I've got a really simple capture, it just uses simple TCP. So if I just open that up and we have a quick look at it. So it doesn't really show a lot, but click it over to hex, starts to show a lot more. It starts to make a lot more sense now. And so the red is obviously stuff going to the car, the blue stuff coming back from the car. So we thought, well, let's start having a look at that and what can we do? How does that, what is that? How does it work? So if I just flip back to the presentation and have a look at how that works. Make so. so what's sent to the car is effectively a message. So F6, the first part of the packet, F6, defines that it is actually a message. So i.e. you want to do something to the car. Then there's a bit about the length of the actual packet, saying how long it's going to be, and then there's the actual command that's sent to the sent to the car, and then a parameter, and the parameter defines you know whether it's on or whether it's off, for example, and then all of that is checksummed, and and that's 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 the end of the packet. So let's turn on the lights, for example. You issue a command of ten with a parameter of one. Turn it off. You issue a parameter of two. So let's have a play on, on that. So this is the command. So up in the top right there, you can see the top left side, you can see the command. So let's see what happens when we issue that command to the things. Now, I haven't got a car with me, unfortunately. So I can't actually do this live. I can't sort of park it over there to do it. So unfortunately, I have got some videos. And sadly, they are not of me. They're of my colleague, Ken. I'm sure you probably know Ken and Ray. So um, hopefully, hang on, I'll start that again so you might be able to hear it. 
Let me try again. Please understand how the protocol works. We've realised we've successfully turned the lights on. I apologise, you are going to hear his voice by a bit, so I've got a few videos. So that's cool, but is there another way of doing it? Well, there is another way of doing it, and the simplest way is to just take apart the app and have a look at how the app works. So, you know, we could Wireshark it all, but we could just look in the app. And I, I don't know if anyone lo has looked at, at apps a lot. I don't know if anyone, any of you do. Does anyone do any, any kind of reverse engineering of apps? It's really, really simple on Android. It's a, lot, a little bit harder on iOS, but it's really, really simple on Android. And the best thing I can suggest you do, if you've got any apps, just start having a look. It's really, really easy. I can do it, and I'm not massively tech compared to some of the, some of the guys we've got. So, all you do, you just download the app, use ADB to then go and grab the, the APK from, from <coughs> the device. As soon as you've got it, then you can use something like Dex, Dex to Jar or JDEX to then start to decompile that. So, let's have a quick look at what the app looks like. So I've got, what I've got is I've got JDEX running. I actually quite like JDEX because you don't have to do any anything before you view it. You can just open it straight away from JDEX. So let's open it up. So all of the code for, for this particular application is all stored within the inventor uh, area and then within iMobile. Now the bits, there's a lot of stuff there. The bits that we're concerned about is in the base structure. So then we've got in here deal message and def message. So the deal message bit kind of defines how the packet is sent to the car. The def message bit defines what you can actually do on the car. So what messages can be sent to it. There's quite a lot of functionality in here that's not visible in the app. And we'll talk about it like, briefly in a second. If I just flick back to the presentation, it's a bit easier to view some of the other bits that we've, we've found. So, this is, yeah, as I say, that's, that's kind of the, the, the deal message bit, and then this is the theft message. And what's interesting when we look through it is we saw things like this, the theft alarm. Well, that's interesting. So does that mean you can make changes to the theft alarm status? And some of these are change mode, change mode, and there's some other ones further on down to, for the lights, for example, which we've already seen and for the charging status. And one of the other things, as I said, is the air conditioning. So let's have a quick look at the air conditioning. So again, I'm sorry, we've got another Ken video. Without using the app, I can crack the pre-show key for the Wi-Fi network to turn on the cooling system. So obviously that's going to cause you a little bit of a problem if you've got an electric car and someone turns on your cooling system overnight. It's great, yeah, your car's going to be cold when you get into it, it's also going to have no battery, so you're not going to be able to go anywhere. So you might have to then, you know, especially fill it out with fuel or something like that and use pollutants. So that's cool, that's one element. But let, the main thing that we wanted to do is to look at the alarms and whether or not we can make any changes to the alarm to turn it on or turn it off. So again, sorry, a bit of a video of Ken, I haven't got a car, it's a lot easier when you have the car, I promise you. But anyway, let's just play this one. So this is just the alarm off. So it's just a demonstration that, you know, the alarm is on. So let's give it a go. Actually, to prove it's working. There we go. So the alarm's definitely on, right? So, yeah, obviously we could smash the windows, Ken said there, to, to gain access to it. But that would set off the alarm and that might alert the owner. So if we send this command, though, and this was only recently announced at a DEF CON because we kind of felt it wasn't bad, it wasn't good kind of telling everybody how to unlock people's cars or to turn off the alarm on people's cars. So that was recently announced, so that's relatively new. Um, so once you send that command to the car, this happens. It's not going off. Even worse, and now in the car. So you can really easily just turn off the alarm, smash the window, obviously, you know, Ken's got the window open, it's his car, he doesn't want to have to tape up the window every day. So you, you smash the window, you're in the car, you can unlock the door, it doesn't seem to have any deadlocks properly applied, so you can quite easily just unlock it once you smash the, the window. And at that point you can access things like the ODB, for example, or perhaps other systems within the car. <coughs> so, like all good pen testers, we find, you know, that's a bit annoying, isn't it? You know, having to issue that command over time. Wouldn't it be much easier if we could just script it? 
So, of course, yeah, we've got some very clever guys and they decided to go ahead and script it. So I actually got, got no, I, won't, I won't be able to show any whole script because it's all basically written there. So essentially, what we've got is we can either turn on or off the lights. Yeah, we did this for the demo purposes, lots of other bits and pieces we can put in there. Um, and then the alarm on or off, and then also further up on, on the script list and you know, turning the air conditioning on and so on and so forth. So it's really simple. We then just script it and then we can turn on or off the alarm. Really cool. What we find though, when we look through the manual, is actually Mitsubishi are not following their standards. They say in the manual, that you shouldn't be able to do access the settings. So access in the settings is where the, the theft alarm is. You shouldn't be able to access that unless you disable the alarm first, but yet you can, which is not ideal at all. Um, one thing I would say though, what is really, really good about this car is, is actually the, the access point will go to sleep if you don't drive the car for more than 24 hours. But most people, I guess, will probably have a car and drive it. I don't know. Most people do, but yeah. Maybe you don't, but if you don't drive for 24 hours, the access point will turn off. The minute you turn the car back on, of course, the access point will connect, it will start back up again. And if your phone is moving range of it, of course, it will connect up. So that, you know, it's kind of a bit of a, bit of a, a, a fix of the issue. How you really fix it? Well, if you've got one of these cars, the best way to fix it is to just go into the app and cancel the VIN registration. When you cancel the VIN registration, as long as you do that on every phone that has got it enabled, what will happen is the access point will effectively turn itself off automatically. Uh, you can turn it back on again, it takes 10 remote pushes to turn it back on. Mitsubishi have suggested another option to, to turn it off, and that's to press the remote button 20, 30 times, something like that. So I think you do 10 times and then you do another 30 times. It's ridiculous. Um, but that will ultimately deactivate everybody's phone. So if someone is connected to your car that you don't know, and you're not going to know someone's someone's access to your car, you, you, know, you can you can do that through through there, so you can cancel it. And so if you are selling the car, that's something I'd recommend you do. The dealer will do it as part of the process of selling the car with the dealer. But you know, if you're going to sell it privately, that's something I'd really recommend you do. Long term, to fix it, it is going to need a firmware update to the device. Problem is, the way that Mitsubishi expects you to update the firmware is through the app, through your phone, through this wireless access point, which is incredibly unstable, that you need to be stood right next to. That you also cannot have your phone run out of battery. You cannot lose the wireless connectivity, otherwise you're going to brick your car. So it's a bit of a problem. But there, I'll, show, I'll show you the code actually. The, 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 the firmware app, app update is actually in the app. Is it? It's really easy to see. So I don't know if any, you know, one thing I one thing I would say, it's quite useful to open up an APK in 7-zip because you can kind of see all the stuff in there. And so contained within the resource file in the, <coughs> if you go into the raw, there's the firmware updates. So I think when we first looked at it, there was ROM 3, there's now ROM 4. Why, why someone would update their phone, uh, the, update their car through their mobile phone, phone through a really poor wireless connection? I just I just don't know. It's a bit brave, I wouldn't do it, put it that way. I suggest, really, that they're going to have to kind of get some of these cars back and, you know, when they do a service, then update the system at that point. Because, you know, the reality is, it's just too risky to do it through this unstable wireless access point on your mobile phone. You don't even know how long it's going to take, either. You know, it could take 10 minutes, it could take half an hour. Do you want to sit in your car for half an hour while you're updating the phone? I guess some of you might do. I, I probably wouldn't because I'm a bit of a nerd, but anyway. It's sort of... So even though you've updated the firmware, there are other attacks you can do with this. And you know, what else can you do? Well, you can kind of track them. Because it's a wireless access point, remember? And when access points get discovered, they get discovered on Wiggle.net. So there's loads of them. So before we uh, disclosed, there was around 6,000 of these cars that you could find. So you could track them to people's houses or wherever they've been discovered on Wiggle. Quite a lot of them are around Sirencester, which happens to be where their, their dealership is or where, where the cars are built. After we told Mitsubishi and after the BBC published their from the, the, the vulnerability, there's a further 400 devices. So what's going on? Why are people doing this? Why are people enabling the wireless after we've told them there's a flaw? Who knows? Anyway. Interestingly now, if you go to Wiggle, 
you can't actually find any. So what happened is Wiggle have received some kind of a message from Mitsubishi, whether it's a, uh, a legal message or whether it's just, um, uh, you know, please will you do this uh, for, the, for the goodness of everybody. Somehow they've removed all of these from their database. So it does, you know, it does prove that that does work. And so, you know, if you want to get your access point taken off Wiggle, you can either contact Wiggle or you can just change your access point to remote and then load the numbers and then it'll get taken off. So, you know, everything works. <clears throat> what are our next steps? Well, you know, Wi-Fi has given us the way to get into the car. And that's great, but actually, when I were in the car, what we could do is we could start looking at our ODB port to see whether there's any appropriate segregation between the various networks. Um, this is the actual, this picture here is the actual uh, Wi-Fi module here. So, you know, our next step is to kind of take that off and see if there's any vulnerabilities that would uh, affect the separation between between the CAN, which is obviously where all of the, the important stuff goes on, and the actual Wi-Fi for some of the other less important stuff. Um, also, contained within the application is quite a lot of functionality. I said there's a lot, I said earlier on there's a lot of functionality. There's this one, which we're not quite sure what it does. We don't know whether it's the export mode or model, or maybe that's the one that goes to IS, who knows, but I don't know. But anyway, you can do something with some guns. I've not figured that one out yet. Um, so in terms of disclosure, we contacted Mitsubishi, as you would expect, as a responsible organisation, and, uh, and gave them all of the information, and we didn't hear anything for 10 days. Literally not a response. So we then contacted them again and said, look, you know, what's going on? Um, we see this is a very serious issue, and, and, and their response was, well, you know, it's not really an issue, we don't see it as a problem, and, uh, and we're not going to bother fixing it. And we're like, right, okay. But to be fair to them, it wasn't the best day for them for us to contact them, it was the day that their emission scandal broke, and I'm guessing their PR department had a bit of a tough day that day. But anyway, so we, we then thought, well, you know, we've got to do something about this. We did ask them, we did say to them, well, how would you feel if we went to the BBC? And they said we'd say, the same, we'd say exactly the same thing to the BBC as we said to you, so fair enough. So we went to the BBC. <laughs> Funnily enough, that changed their opinion. Suddenly they decided that actually it's a very serious issue and they shouldn't have said that before. And now they are going to take it very seriously, which is great. And they did, as you know, you probably saw the press, it, it was taken seriously. Um, they are now talking to us and they are working on a fix and we are identifying uh, the, the remediation for that with them. Um, but how should you really do disclosure? Well, really, you know, you should make it really easy for people to contact you. It's common sense. So set up a public website or some kind of a page on your site or set up some kind of a bug bounty. So it's, you know, using bug crack, for example. And then once contact's been made, you know, listen, to the, listen to the researcher, d determine whether there is a vulnerability. And if there is a vulnerability, confirm a fix back to the researcher. And then once you've got your remediation planning process, then only then can the researcher then start to think about their publicity. Most security researchers we find, you know, they're usually well-intentioned. I'm sure some of you are security researchers, and you know, most of you are very well-intentioned. I don't bore you, you yeah, know. So, you know, if you are a manufacturer of one of these vehicles, or you are doing any kind of uh, anything like this, you, you know, embrace the security community. Set your terms on what you want to, to, to get from them, and what you will do, and, you know, give them credit. It's important to get credit. You know, we all like credit, don't we, right? You know, we do things so that we can get a little bit of credit and further our knowledge as well. One of the best ways to do credit, in my opinion, is to use a bug bounty. And so when you're using bug bounties, make sure, you know, make sure that you, you set a good one. You know, make sure it's cost effective. Um, because in reality, it is a lot more cost effective than having to do a full recall on, you know, hundreds of thousands of cars. Ideally, publish some kind of a kudos system, or perhaps give some money, for example. Um, that's one, one good way of doing it. But better still, give them a car to play with. I know that sounds a little bit far-fetched, but actually, is it really? Manufacturers, when they make these cars, they're selling, what, £40,000 a car? They've sold millions of them. They're making a lot of money. £40,000 is not actually a huge amount of money to give to someone for them to be able to check that there's any vulnerabilities. And you can even ask for it back after a year if you really want to. So, you know, you've not lost any money. You're still going to sell that on for a relative cost. You know, it's not going to lose a lot of money. So I'd recommend giving them the car. 
especially if they happen to be Ferrari or something like that. I definitely look forward to looking at one of their cars. Anyway, um, current, have a look at some of the existing bug bounties, and actually there aren't very many for vehicle manufacturers. Tesla have got one, they will pay up to $10,000 to bug crack, which is good, but $10,000 for a full remote compromise of a what $100,000 car? Really? I think that's a bit cheap, if I'm entirely honest, but fair enough. You know? Then if we look at Fiat Chrysler, they've got lots and lots of different cars, they'll pay up to $1,500. Really? $1,500 for a full compromise of one of their cars. This, you know, They make millions and millions and billions, potentially, of dollars a year selling cars. Ridiculous. Uh, GM, they, they just won't sue you. You don't get any money, you just won't get sued. Bonus. Um, Ford, yes, we're, we're taking security very seriously and we regularly review the security, uh, the, the, the security environment, so they're not doing anything then. And no one else does anything. There's no other bug bounties that I could find from car manufacturers. And I think that's tragic because these things are very, very important now. You know, look at cars, they've got so much stuff in them now that could be vulnerable. Some of the other attacks in terms of you know cars it doesn't have to be about stealing the car. You know, it could be about that. It's not clear enough. It's still not much clearer. Putting ransomware on a car. I know this sounds a bit of a weird, far-fetched thing, and I guess it probably is a little bit. We've not seen ransomware at any time soon, but you know the potential is there. And um, to illustrate that. Let's have a look at thermostat. So I've come switched over from cars. I'm going to look at thermostat now. So we, we presented this at DEF CON, so you may have seen a bit of it. But, um, but essentially, this is a, a thermostat. I can't tell you who, who it is because we, we've agreed not to uh, disclose their name at the moment. But if you know your thermostats, I'm sure you'll probably recognize it. And we found that um, it's an ARM-based system. You can find that really easily. Just go to the FCC website, search on their, on their site there. You can find quite a lot of information about it, including reports of the actual hardware, and including photos of the actual hardware, which is a really cool thing. So I recommend you do that if you, if you want to find information out about devices you're looking at. And we felt that you could almost certainly, based on, on the, the stuff at the FCC, be able to get root on the device. And from that point, what, you know, could we put some proof of concept ransomware on the device? Don't just think, though, it's kind of these modern IoT devices that are on there. Just search for any car manufacturer you want on there. Anything that's sold in America that has any kind of wireless communications has to be in this database. So you can find loads and loads of stuff. So there's Mitsubishi, there's some kind of um, uh, remote sensor for Ducati. I think this is um, keyless entry. This is a keyless entry module for, for a Mitsubishi. Um, uh, and that's some kind of Bluetooth module on the car as well. So you can see detailed descriptions of the, the, the hardware before you start pulling it apart. So that's quite useful for kind of getting a view on whether or not you're going to be successful in terms of getting vulnerabilities. So if we have a look at the, the thermostat itself. So I mentioned it's a, an ARM processor. <coughs> um, it's also got some, some uh, memory on there, so 128 meg of memory, uh, and it's also got a gigabyte of, of storage on there, um, Wi-Fi module as well. Bizarrely, there's an SD card on the device, which is a little bit weird. You kind of think, why does the thermostat need an SD card? We'll talk about why in a second. Um, there's also some serial output on there, so there's a six-pin six output, so you can, you, know, you can plug in and get some serial output on the device. Couldn't find any JTAG. Which is, I guess, good, but you know, plenty of other ways to get into it. The firmware for the device is updated <coughs> through Air application, so you know, Adobe Air, so you download this Windows Air application, the firmware is embedded in there, so if you open up the, that application, just unzip it, you can view the firmware, and there's the firmware, just open it with Binwalk, and you can view, view, view the, the firmware itself. Um, once you do that, you can kind of virtually mount the file system, and then you can see you know, the file system. For, for the firmware, which is quite cool, and all of the important stuff. So once we had a look at the firmware, what we find is actually the, the stuff which manages the thermostat is, is essentially a giant, well, I say giant, a very large JavaScript file, a single JavaScript file. And there wasn't any user validation on that, or any input validation on that. So what you could do is you could load some images onto the, into, the, into the binary, and then put whatever you want into it, because there's no validation. So effectively, you can start appending bad stuff to it. So there's the, uh, there's the application. 
PC Windows application and writes to the SD card, so that's why you've got the SD card. So you know, end users demanded the ability to set a screensaver on their on their thermostat. Obviously, that's a very important functionality, I think, for my thermostat. Never mind the heating and controlling of my house. I'd like to have a, right, the, a picture of my recent holidays on there. Um, and also, it things like the settings, uh, update the firmware as well, obviously, uh, and you know, set, set your screen saves, as I said. So in terms of taking control of this thermostat, <coughs> what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out where the outputs were. And so it's quite simple, really. And we effectively just appended a, a simple ping to it. To, to the to the image and then loaded that up and then essentially whatever came out we could then start targeting. Um, once we got that we were then able to inject other complex stuff like telnet for example. So that gave us remote cons re remote persistency on the device. And of course you know with roots so we're able to load whatever we want onto there. So you know it's very simple then to start loading things like ransomware. So you're able to then just, you know, it's really simple stuff, just change the screensaver, show it, so it shows your, your ransomware picture, you know, lock the device um, using a pin so we can code it so it changes that pin frequently, so from that respect, you know, the end user is never going to be able to guess it, all right, it's only a four digit pin, but you know, it's still not going to be easy to guess it. Best thing of all, you can stick an annoying buzzer on there, so it constantly buzzes them, that's going to really annoy them. Uh, change the, the outputs, so the heating and the cooling outputs as well. One thing that we <coughs> like to do is rather than just making it really, really cold in winter and really, really hot in summer, is to put both on. So it's maximum on both. So the system doesn't really know what it's going to do, and ultimately you're going to have a really large electricity bill. So, you know, the incentive will be there to, to get it fixed. So what can you do if you've got ransomware on your thermostat? I'm, granted, this is a bit theoretical. What can you do? Well, you can throw it away, get a new one, and I think they're only about $200. So, yeah, all right, maybe your Bitcoin is a little bit steep to get access back to your thermostat and just buy a new one. Um, or you can pay the ransom. You never know. People are paying ransoms. They might pay a ransom for your thermostat. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, a little bit theoretical, I have to say, in terms of uh, the, the ransomware thermostat. But, yeah, I think it's certainly a really interesting space and you know could that mean a jump back to cars so you know where, where you're putting ransomware on someone's car where you're preventing someone from driving just simply through ransomware on the car potentially we just go back to ECU hacking I just want to briefly touch on ECU hacking and um, it's not particularly something I've got a huge amount of experience with so please don't ask me questions after about it um, in terms of ECUs, now that's a really old ECU from HKS, um, so people who are familiar with car tuning will know who HKS are. Um, and this is a really old uh, ECU, and, and old ECUs were pretty simple. You know, they weren't complex devices. They had just a few number, a few microcontrollers, didn't do a huge amount of stuff. Nowadays, ECUs are much more complex because they're doing so much more stuff. So we've got things like Wi-Fi, for example, we've got internet, Mac updates, firmware updates, DAB, we've got obviously all of the CAN stuff as well, and all of that other stuff is all in those new ECUs. However, you know, they haven't really increased the security on them. They're still the same from 25 years ago. And so attackers, you know, we've got a lot better at attacking systems in 25 years. And so the security of them is not really that good. And you know, in the old days, in terms of attacking ECUs, all you were trying to do was effectively make your car go faster, or perhaps you know, claim your key so you don't have to pay extortionate amounts from a dealer to get a new key. Nowadays, you've got people who want to get stuff out of their cars that you might not necessarily get out of it. Unlock functionality that perhaps is, is something that is a paid option that you, you, you know, you manufacture would charge you a couple of hundred, hundred pounds for to be able to gain access to. Nowadays, you can just unlock it if you can have ECU. Or perhaps, you know, there's still obviously the existing accessory there you know, enhancing the performance in the key claim. Um, but perhaps organized crime might want to steal cars. You know, if you can, you, if you can get past things like the, um, uh, I can't remember what they're called, the, the theft detectors and the theft, theft systems on the cars, um, or why not, you know, us, us looking at these systems. There's no real security improvements in 25 years, really, that's, that's made it, made these devices harder to be attacked. But attacking them has, has become a lot easier because we've got lots and lots of clever tools and we can do simple things like desoldering stuff and reading the firmware directly. Some systems have even got JTAG ports on, on their, 
their systems. This is actually another thermostat, and over here, this is a, a JTAG board complete with headers, so you can, or headers are connected, so you can easily connect straight into it and read the firmware, the firmware directly off the device. So once you've got firmware, what does it give you? Well, you know, I think we all know, hopefully, what firmware gives you. Lots and lots of important stuff. It gives us the upper hand. We're able to see things like passwords, for example, private keys. We're able to view the code in IDA, for example, and understand how it works. We're even able to get moved. Which is a bit weird. This was a uh, this was a DVR that we looked at, which developers it's a complete disaster of a, of a system. It's for another day that that one. But uh, you know we were able to get find that there was a web shell on there that you get move on. Also, it was an admin shell, but that's a, another story. Um, the problem is that developers think the firmware is something which is hidden. And actually, it's not. And so, as a result, you often find quite interesting and amusing things in firmware, like someone unable to handle their SSL properly. Or perhaps this one, some son of a bitch thing, whatever that's going to do. I can't remember what that does exactly. Um, so, in terms of protecting against this sort of attack, you know, it really needs simple, careful risk assessment. Um, I would suggest it's very, very important nowadays because of the way that researchers are looking at firmware, encrypt it and sign it and validate that at boot. Um, strip all of your debug stuff and all of that stuff from, from, your, from your firmware when you, when you uh, package it up and all of your scripts. And don't trust anything that's put in by the end user. We saw this morning, we were all rickrolled this morning by a Wi-Fi SSID that happened to be a, a, a particular string. Um, you know, think about these privilege, simple concepts, stuff we've done for ages. In terms of the can on the car, it's actually really, really hard to implement security on a CAN because it's, it needs to be incredibly fast. You know, if you've got a system that controls brakes, you kind of want it to be fast and not to be checking the certif certificates or whatever it is whilst it goes along and suddenly you stop, you don't brake. I think the most important thing is to be able to update your firmware. You know, be able to do that over the air. So many manufacturers deploying systems that they have no capability of being able to update, which is bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And I think that's yeah, that's a main main issue in my mind. So what do we do in terms of us? Uh, well, we're pen testers, as I said. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time looking at things like ICS uh, and ECUs as well. We spent a lot of time, in fact, looking at SCADA. Um, we've got some really, really good guys there. We also do, you know, obviously all the basic stuff as well. Um, lots and lots of IoT vulnerabilities. And most of the times we saw this morning, you know, some of the vulnerabilities you're going to find with, with IoT kits kind of, you know, not going to get, not, it's not really high risk in terms of stealing stuff or potentially um, potentially killing you. Whereas with cars, you know, car hacks, you know, it's a bit more serious, I'd say. You know, we saw with Charlie Miller stopping a car in the middle of the freeway. It's bonkers. Um, so yeah, in terms of fixing it, you know, look at least privilege, look at um, least functionality, and encrypting your your communications. And that, yeah, that's really the key message, really. Um, and that's it. Thanks for listening, guys.